Welcome back, everybody. It's the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bogman. Follow me on the Twitter at Bogman Sports. I'm joined, as always, by Pat Fitzmorris at Fitz underscore FF and Derek Brown. It, is it at Debro underscore FF? Is that what it is? Still, see, like sharp as a tack. Not, not all the time. I will forget something that you just told me. But uh, I do remember uh, Twitter handles pretty well. On this episode today, we are going to be discussing the Senior Bowl risers and fallers. And to do that, of course, Debro is here with us. He was just at the Senior Bowl. Uh, Fitzy, you watched the Senior Bowl, paid attention to all the practices. It's always a fun event. What is your relationship with the Senior Bowl? How many have you watched? Have you been watching the whole time? Because I like, I, I remember Amir Abdullah winning player of the game on on this thing. Like a lot of uh, older prospects. But uh, your your thoughts about the Senior Bowl? Yeah, it's always fun. I got to get back. I've not been to one since the 1990s. Wow. That's how long it's been when I was at Pro Football Weekly a long time ago. So I miss uh, sitting out and soaking up the rays at Lad Peebles Stadium like Debro was able to do and, uh, you know, hitting the eating and drinking establishments on Dauphin Street at night. Mobile is a really cool town, uh, really Man. cool town. And Fitzy, Great. you were there before the internet, so uh, pretty much you were there in the nineties. So it was, di- I mean, it was it was different. Like I was seeing a lot of shots of the stands and and Debra on those guys, and like the stands were, I won't say they were filled, but there were a lot of people in the stands. The year I went, no one was in the stands. It's Everyone like was just on the field. The stands yeah. were like where, yeah, the stands were where like new newly hired head coaches would take assistant coaches to go and like talk to them and offer them jobs and stuff like go for a private conversation in the stands. There was no one actually sitting there watching the practices. And then the people would kind of whisper too, cause they didn't want to interrupt the coaches and stuff. I had that at the Arizona fall league uh, out here. I went in like 2007 and the only people in the crowd were the players, girlfriends and wives. That was it. And they were all <laughs> reading books. Right. And I'm sitting there like Cameron Mabin's going to be pretty good, you know? So, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you're, you're there with your speed gun and, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Me and the four other, uh, scouts that are there. Right. <laughs> Right, right. I didn't have quite as much hair, but, you know, uh, I was definitely there I- enjoying it. But, Debro, you were there. You were at the Senior Bowl, and it has become a, a large event. I mean, NFL Network covers practices every single day. There's media sessions every day, too. So uh, I know this is like your third or fourth, too. Just tell us uh, what your experience of the Senior Bowl has been and how important it is to the process. Yeah, man. I mean, look, this is my third year doing it. Second year with Fantasy Pros covering the Senior Bowl, and it gets better every single year. Jim Nagy's blowing it out, man. Like, it is It is now, and I think it's going to continue to grow as a true tentpole event in the offseason, man. Especially with the floodgates getting open this year, where it's not just like... The moniker is, yes, it's, it's the Mobile, it's the Reese's Senior Bowl, but now... We can get juniors at the game as well. So it's just a matter of time, dude, where you're going to get like a bunch of these guys that are going to be top five picks, top 10 picks in the NFL draft are going to make their way to Mobile. And we're all going to be ooing and aahing over all of these guys. And we should be, man. But it's a wonderful, wonderful spectacle. Mobile is a fantastic town. And it's it's awesome every single year we go, whether you want to talk about boots on the ground, getting to watch these players at practice every single day, getting to mingle with coaches, scouts, agents. Um, some I mean, sometimes you'll run into like players, family and stuff. I know a lot of people that, you know, if you've been out there on social media, you've seen it like Jerry Rice was down there supporting his son. Yeah. Terrell Owens was in the crowd um, down there for the 75th uh celebration and stuff dude so it's it's really become and i think will continue to build as a star-studded event of the offseason and the moniker is true the draft starts in mobile it's real man like this is the kickoff the prospect season every single year so people need to be tapped in yeah and i don't understand what is going on with the shrine game being now the same week as the Senior Bowl because the Senior yeah. Bowl has the better players. It takes precedent. You know, uh, I, I know people are excited about the Shrine Game, too, and it, it's a fun the event. The Shrine Game's but, good, too, man. I'm not going to shade it, but it's it, good, well, too. Well, you also, I mean, I wouldn't shade the event, but I would shade the event being three days before the Senior Bowl. Like, put it yeah. the week before or the week after, like, whatever you got to do. Uh, but, you know, make it not so close to the Senior Bowl because we're all paying attention to the Senior Bowl. It has the better prospects in it, and you ha- see guys from the Shrine Game move to the senior bowl because players get hurt or opt out or whatever it is. So yeah, just a great event. And I, I saw a clip of 
Thurman Thomas uh, talking about how he won a car for winning player of the game when he was the Super Bowl or the Senior Bowl MVP. And now they give out like it's just a large Reese's peanut butter cup or something <laughs> uh, to, to the champion way less than a car. He's like, no, oh, I drove my car home uh, after I won it at the senior bowl, which was uh, very interesting. So the event has changed a lot, but um, I got to tell you guys, before we get to our next senior bowl takeaway, do you want a chance to win big with your Super Bowl picks. Let me tell you about a Super Bowl contest we have going on over at Betting Pros to enter. First, download the Betting Pros app at bettingpros.com slash apps. Next, join the Super Bowl 58 contest group with the app or head over to bettingpros.com slash super. Just place a minimum of five NFL bets on the Super Bowl. It's that simple. If sports betting isn't legal in your state, don't worry. You can still participate in our contest using the quick pick feature from game picks to player props. Every pick counts. Join now make your bets and you could win premium subscriptions to both fantasy pros and betting pros plus more again join our super bowl contest on the betting pros app over at bettingpros.com super may the best picks win all right fitzy kick us off on the senior bowl wrap up and throw your first question out at d bro yeah, Debro, let's talk about running backs. It's a really interesting class. I don't think we've got any sort of consensus on who the top running back or even the top three or four running backs are going to be in this year's draft. Um, but there were some interesting ones down in Mobile, and I know you are fond of one in particular. So why don't you uh, sing the praises of your guy, Marshawn Lloyd of USC? He's a true three down back, man. And he proved that immobile. And I will keep singing his praises. And if people are looking at early ADP for Dynasty rookie drafts, you're seeing him go anywhere between the back end of the second round, somewhere in the third round. I'm telling you right now, if I have anything to say about it, that is going to rise the closer we get to the NFL draft. We're going to put some more freaking respect on Marshawn Lloyd's name. He is a true three down running back. I'm not going to mince words about it, man, because what he showed at Mobile should put the stamp on that, and people need to respect his game. For a running back prospect, guys, over the last two seasons at USC, Top 20 in yards up to contact per attempt, breakaway run rate, also PFF elusive rating. So we know what this man brings to the table as far as on early downs, but what he proved in Mobile is that he is also a very good receiver out of the backfield. Two days of practice, he closed two days in a row with standout reps in one-on-one -on -one and team drills in the passing game. Day two, this man ran a wheel route out of the backfield, up the sideline, had a beautiful basket catch over his shoulder, and everybody, myself included, Thor, everybody in the stands go, oh, <laughs> baby, there we go, let's go. And that's real about Marshawn Lloyd as a guy that also, if you watch his film, he is a dog in pass protection. So I think that's an area where he continues to grow. He proved himself as a receiver. That man will be a top four round pick in the NFL draft. I have a third round grade on him right now. Well, just to so put a fine point on that. Like, I don't think Debro is guaranteeing that Marshawn Lloyd is going to come out and instantly be a three down workhorse for some team. We don't know if that'll mm -hmm. happen. But if you have a three down skill set, that gives you more opportunities to break in and get playing time as a rookie year because you could be an early down back. You could be a passing down back. Um, it's going to get him onto the field faster. So it's nice to know that he has the versatility to be able to play on any down for whichever team uh, is employing him in the fall. Yeah, Marshawn Lloyd, uh, you know, big time prospect going to South Carolina and mm -hmm. then faced a lot of eight, nine man boxes. They didn't have a, a lot of passing game there. He left. Spencer Rattler went in and they went more to a passing offense in South Carolina. And then he kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit over at USC. Everyone's talking about uh, Caleb Williams and Brennan Rice is there and uh, Aaron uh, Jones is there. So th there's a lot of. There's a lot of talent at USC. He kind of got lost in the mix, so I'm glad you brought him to the forefront here, D-Bro. I want to ask you about the quarterbacks, Bo Nix and Michael Penix, because you and I just participated in the first mock draft for Fantasy Pros. People can check that show out as well. Uh, but we didn't put either one of these guys in the first round. I had a chance to do it, too. I picked for the Broncos. I could have taken him. I went with Jared Verse instead. These guys are both slipping down the board after their weekend at the Super Bowl. And this event isn't really it's it's harsh for quarterbacks because 
you know, you build timing, you build a relationship with your receivers. So it, we didn't see a lot from Penix or Bo Nix down there, but we've seen plenty of quarterback prospects go down there and have a great week. And these guys didn't. Spencer Rattler did, surprisingly. But uh, tell us about Nix and Penix. They're not it, man. Neither one of these guys. And both evaluating them before I went to Mobile, I didn't put them in the first round conversation even before I went to Mobile. If you look at how both their games translate to the NFL, Bo Nix operated it in an offense in Oregon where he was just asked to be a, a point guard. Lots of screens, a lot of three-step drops, get the ball out of, out of his hands real fast, a lot of first read predetermined stuff where it's literally hike it, snap, shoof. Shoof, shoof, and then literally everybody's doing everything for him after the catch. He had, he had, he was bottom ten in deep ball rate, and his deep ball is not great. To say like he does have the arm strength to make those throws, but Bo Nix is not a first round prospect. He should have never been put in the first round conversation, and he didn't do anything to help himself in Mobile. You saw he was up and down throughout practice throughout the week. Whether it was and and this also bleeds over to Michael Penix. Put both of these guys in the same bucket in the sense that. They don't have the quickest triggers whenever they're not operating on those three step drops. And it's literally predetermined first read, get the ball out fast and let guys do stuff after the catch. When that's not the onus of the play and that's not the play design. And these guys are forced to sit back in, in the pocket and go through half field reads, full field reads, get the ball out of their hands. The triggers are slow and projecting them to the NFL they don't deserve that type of hype where they shouldn't even be in the first round conversation. I have round three grades on both of these guys. And that might sound harsh, but it's just a reality, man. Like we have to marry what we've seen on the field also with the evaluations and the true parts about their skill sets and the concerns. Because if you have slow triggers, you go to the NFL, the speed of the game speeds up, depending on what team you land on the offensive line. We talk about Penix, whether you want to mention his injury history or just the fact that he's not not the most mobile guy in the pocket, those problems with trigger get worse when the game speeds up. And rookies talk about it every single year. The college game to the pro game, it speeds up and you better buckle in and get ready. And I don't think either one of those guys are fully prepared for that type of change. So they didn't have good weeks in Mobile, whether you want to talk about uh, trigger, you want to talk about running the, the offense, you want to talk about accuracy, both in the pocket, on the move, and they're in to the totality of their weeks they did nothing to help themselves. And look, I, I I think both these guys still have a shot at the first round, right? They can still impress at the combine. And the fact that when you take a guy in a first round, you get that extra year. Teams want to do that with a quarterback so that he's cheaper for one more year, right? So you, you open up your window a little more. But I do think that it's less likely that Penix or Knicks get picked in the middle of the first round. And it's more like someone trades into that back end. And that's where they uh, pick these guys up. Like D bro said, third round grade, but there's so many teams that are desperate for a quarterback. I think the value of that position is going to be uh, picked up a little bit. What do you got next for us? Fitzy? Well, I think everyone knows that this is a really exciting wide receiver class. We didn't see any of the three headliners of this class in Mobile. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, the guys we know are going to be drafted in the top half of the first round. Um, but there was still a lot of intriguing talent down in Mobile, Debro. I know you're fond of Javon Baker from UCF. Uh, please tell people about him. He's going to surprise people. And for a guy that I was extremely high, like my wide receiver one entering Mobile and leaving Mobile. And some people could say it's not deserved to keep him as the wide receiver one, considering the weeks of, and we're going to talk about Roman Wilson, Lab McConkey that they had. But I still think Javon Baker is a dude. He is an absolute dude. And looking at a guy that was, I mean, look, he was a highly touted prospect, goes to Alabama, doesn't get much playing time, goes to UCF, and in 2023, he ranked 8th in yards per route run against all FBS wide receivers, at least 50 targets, 24th in receiving grade, and 35th in yak per reception, as well as saying that he was top 20 in contested catch rate. And say what you will about just that metric, but Javon Baker has the, the overall skill set to be a high-volume wide receiver in the NFL. Whether you want to talk about the ability to stretch the field, he did have some issues getting jammed up on boundary routes, go routes specifically in Mobile. But the other parts of his game where he specifically wins and the high points of his game, he did also show out in the sense that he does he he's a very good route runner. He has nuanced 
to his routes. He can get open as far as short area agility underneath. And we saw that as well as day three. What I wanted to see out of Javon Baker was that typical, if you turn the tape on for Javon Baker, that typical Javon Baker high point, beautiful catch and we saw that to open day three and one-on-ones he ran it was either an out route or a post in uh in, in into the end zone and skied over a corner and made a wonderful catch and i'm like you know what that's Javon Baker. That's the guy that I saw on film. I've got a third round grade on him right now. And people could say this, this comp that I have, and it's, it's, it's already live on fantasy pros. If you go back and you look at my wide receiver primer for the senior bowl, I'm not moving off of it. There are a lot of comparables to his game and one Chris Godwin. Wow. Hmm. I like it. And, and Baker, another dude, big time, uh, you know, recruit at Bama goes to UCF, makes a little bit of noise and explodes in the senior bowl and puts himself on the map. This wide receiver class is deep. It's so deep. There's so many good ones. Lad McConkey, I believe came into the senior bowl as the top wide receiver on the senior bowl boards to most people. But Roman Wilson, was so good. He was dominant. He had amazing plays in practice, so much so that he left on Thursday. He said, I've done enough. I've proved myself. I don't need to do anymore. I don't need to play in the game. I can just exit. So Roman Wilson, uh, you know, impressed and then left. Lad McConkey had a great showing as well. How high are these guys going to go, D-Bro? Are these definitely second round picks? Are they uh, third round picks? Definitely going on day two, right? Yeah, I mean, I think they're definitely, they've both sewn themselves into day two selection. Now, we can all debate where that's going to be. I'm sorry, but people are getting Patriots out over their skis. People are getting out over their skis putting Lad McConkey in the first round. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that out there right now because I've seen that in a few mocks. I don't think that he ju- he's... His game is justified to go in the first round. I just don't think that. Like, for me, if you're going to sell me on a first-round pick in the NFL draft, I need to see in my mind's eye the upside for that wide receiver, whether he comes out as a finished product or close to a finished product, and you can project him as a wide receiver one in an NFL offense, that's what gets you the first round great. Both of these guys, and and I, I do not want to sit here and dismiss either one of their weeks. They both had fantastic freaking weeks. But if we're trying to, again, I don't want to get too crazy off of three days of practice and throw evals watching six, seven, eight games on guys in the trash. Do we add what we see in mobile and practices and what I saw live to the evaluation? Yes. I'm going to go back and tweak all my write-ups before my wide receiver primers for rookies go live on the site. But both of these guys had great weeks. But Lab McConkey, I think he's going to be a second round pick probably as long as he tests good. I think walking into the process, he's probably a third round pick in the NFL draft. Roman Wilson, I think helped himself a ton going from probably a fourth round projected guy and me and Thor went back and forth on this. Yes, I will take the L. He has four, three speed. I've seen all the stuff about the freak list and stuff like that. So the speed is real, but him winning the, the, the other parts of their game where you have a little bit of concern is we know their ability from the slot, both of them prove that in spades in college, but you put them on the perimeter. Can they be 50, 50 guys where you put them on outside, inside, they have that type of versatility to also play in 12 or 21 personnel and not just 11 personnel. I think that Roman Wilson probably is just a slot only guy, probably a 70, 80% slot slot rate guy in the NFL, because in some of the reps you saw him get jammed up uh, on the, off the line, or you saw him deal or have some issues with, with, with physical uh, physicality and press coverage in the route from corners. Whereas Ladd, I think the upper body strength, I think the nuance in his route running, he acquits himself better on the outside, and we saw that throughout the week. So I'm not shocking anybody telling you that Ladd McConkey is a better prospect than Roman Wilson, but both of these guys really helped themselves as far as the draft stock for the NFL draft. Yeah, uh, very interesting for Roman Wilson, too, a guy that just didn't get a lot of usage at Michigan because they ran the ball so much and then showing out when he got his opportunity.
Uh, before we move on here, by now, most of you have probably heard of Reality Sports Online, the powerful fantasy sports platform where owners get to build and manage their fantasy team like an NFL general manager. But the question is, have you tried it? It's time to see what all the buzz in the Dynasty community is about. Free agency, multi-year contracts, a rookie draft, multi-team trades, franchise tags, contract extensions, first-round rookie options, automated, autom automated contract and salary cap functionality, and much more much more think it sounds complicated it is not the best thing about reality sports online fantasy front office is that it doesn't take any more time than a standard league it just requires more strategy think you're among the fantasy elite well this is the platform to test your metal still not sure you can test out your general manager skills for free F R E in a mock free agency auction if you like what you see use promo code fantasy pros to receive a 10 percent discount on your team or league today that's promo code fantasy pros to receive a 10 percent 10 percent discount on your team or league today fantasy just got real at reality sports online.com what do you got next for Debro, bro fitzy oh one guy i've been dying to ask d bro about because <laughs> this guy is so intriguing is johnny wilson of florida state so this guy is what six seven i believe what does he go like 237 or so yeah, he What's weighed in um, at six, or he he measured in at six six two thirty eight. I'm pretty sure two thirty eight. Okay, so he yep. is. I could see the league hosting sites like CBS and Yahoo having meetings to def try to figure out whether <laughs> he's going to get tight end eligibility or yep. wide receiver eligibility or both, because. Um, like his role is going to be uh, like. I don't know. What do you what do you see him as in the NFL, Debro? I mean, obviously this guy's a, a physical specimen. Um how Isaiah do you see likely. him being used? Oh, he he puts Isaiah likely to shame, man. I'm telling you right now. Like well, you didn't really. like Isaiah like you were low on Isaiah Likely. I was in, lower though. on Isaiah Likely, but the other thing about it, Isaiah Likely tested okay, but not great. I'm telling you right now, Johnny Wilson's gonna test out the damn gym. I, as a guy that in high school, and let's talk about this for a second. In high school, he ran a four five nine forty. So you put him in a collegiate strength program, and as well as we know he's going to train for these events for the combine, he's going to blow the damn roof off of the gym because as a guy that's six foot six in two thirty two forty, a person that size, a human that size, should not move with the fluidity that Johnny Wilson moves at, man. So looking at him, all he has to do, he's going to test well. And when that happens, he's going to garner really good draft capital in the NFL. And the thing for Johnny Wilson, man, that I want to mention here is that, you know, we could talk about what he did in college and, and the, the abilities that he put on tape because it's, it's real dude. Like for a guy that over Johnny Wilson's career, like the 2023 numbers were not spectacular, but if you look at 2022, fourth in yards per route run amongst all FBS wide receivers with at least 50 targets, 25th in PFF receiving grade. So he has put up the numbers from an analytical standpoint that we want to see. But what you see when you turn on the film and what we saw and the brief time in Mobile, because I also have to mention here, Johnny Wilson was there all day, day one of practice. Day two, he was in, in practice for the one-on-one -on -one drills to open practice. But then midday, left was nowhere to be seen he did not practice on day three the best that i can surmise and i haven't seen this reported so look if y'all seen this guys correct me if i'm <laughs> wrong but i i think it was an injury that kept him out of the the afternoon for day two and for day three and also again the boots on the ground aspect of being a mobile we were standing out in the hallway it was thor uh, thor myself and mike mayer our director of content we were all out in the hallway uploading videos for our for our social team and and all of the guys that were switching out, like the first group for, for the, the entire media uh, engagement part, where you basically, everybody's in the convention room, and you walk around, you're talking to everybody, and it, you get the American team, you get the national team, and Johnny Wilson starts strolling down the hall, and I'm like, oh, dude. I got to talk to Johnny. I got I to gotta, I gotta talk to him. Our team's asking him to work out a tight end. What does that look like? Which, by the way, to throw that out there, I did not hear that buzz. I was hoping to hear that buzz in Mobile. I'm hoping that that happens or comes to fruition, not to say that he cannot play true wide receiver in the NFL. Just I think he can. Options, though. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And the other thing about it is 
if you were to tell me he was going to have tight end eligibility, he would bump up his NFL draft stock immediately as well. Because my comp for him, based off of size, speed, and his skills right now is Darren Waller. And I don't think that that is over the moon. Because if you watch Johnny Wilson, that type of fluidity, the physicality, the ability, and also we need to talk about the ability to, to stretch the defense. You put Johnny Wilson in the slot, and he is going to stretch down the seam, man. But getting back to day three or day two, as far as the media stuff, he starts walking down the hallway and somebody stops him halfway. He does a 180 and turns the other way and keeps and, and starts walking away from the media uh, engagements uh, stuff. And I'm like, OK, is he hurt? Did he not want to answer questions about all that because he wasn't present? And then he wasn't present. Um, as far as day two, the the afternoon practice or the, the latter part of that or day three's practice. So. Johnny Wilson, I would have loved to have seen what he could have done throughout a full week of practice because day one was a little bit rough for him. Uh, we also have to mention the drops are an issue and they're, they're part of his evaluation as a prospect. Some of that you could say is concentration drops, but it has been a consistent theme. He did drop some balls on day one. They got him to run more perimeter routes. Day two is where you start the magic start to happen for Johnny Wilson. They put him against guys and ask him to run e either out routes or crossers and that's where you saw the ability of Johnny Wilson, the ability to take a corner, lean his shoulder in, and then explode outside with that type of lateral agility on out routes or, again, drag routes and crossers. That's where he's going to make his money, man. Like, you could put him as a big slot, put him as a move tight end. He is going to be a matchup nightmare in the NFL. Put him in Chicago with Caleb Williams. That's what I want to see. Ooh, uh, love it. I think that would be a, a nice transition. How about speaking of transitioning, how about let's go from a big dude to a tiny dude in terms of the NFL draft. Jacob Cowing, right? Jacob Cowing came in, I believe he was 5'8", 165, yep. picked up yep. an injury at the Senior Bowl too. But this guy was very, very productive at Arizona. We had some, uh, we had a little guy in Tank Dell make some noise last year in, in the NFL draft and then in the season for our fantasy teams. Is Jacob Cowing in the Tank Dell mold or is he in the too small for the NFL mold? He's in the Tutu Atwell mold. And I hate to say that because I, and just keep it in 100 here. I had Jake Cow Jacob Cowing, and I had him ranked as my wide receiver two for entering Senior Bowl, and not not amongst the entire class, but just, just the, the Senior, senior Bowl, Bowl yeah, guys. Sure. Amongst them, I had him as, had him as my wide receiver two. And again, we're talking about adding other layers to the context of the evaluation. What I wanted to see out of Jacob Cowing, and you, you brought it up, Boggs, like as a guy who was listed at Arizona as 5'11", 175, he comes in, he weighs in, measures in at 5'8", 165. So any questions about size and stuff and his ability to play the perimeter just got magnified 10 times over. And so I will definitively tell you, he is not Tank Dell. He is not that type of guy that can win on the perimeter. And I massively drop cowing and, and and I hate it, man. Like I'm not I'm not trying to throw shade at the kid because he's talented. I think he does uh carve out a role as an NFL slot, but mm -hmm. as that type of upside to say, okay, could he be this year's tank Dell? That's not it, man, because cowing struggled mightily throughout the week. Whether you want to talk about cor corners having the ability to get their hands on him in routes, him not having the footwork and the necessary speed as a trump card to beat guys off the line or the physicality in his routes where he can't get pushed off of routes. He's not having issues at the catch point because either whether it's speed or footwork or route nuance, he's able to separate from guys you didn't see enough of that from cowing. And we're talking about one-on-one -on -one drills that are in, in, inherently designed to, like, they give a little bit of edge to the wide receiver. Like, let's right. just call it what it is. So if you're having issues in this type of setting, getting off the line and not getting bumped off your routes, as well as getting bullied at the freaking catch point, you're, those those issues are going to translate to the freaking NFL, man. So Cowling's a guy who's a big faller. He entered the process, like I said, as my wide receiver two in my senior bowl wide receiver ranks. He exits the process as my fourth lowest wide receiver. Yeah, I think he ends up a late day three pick and 
you think of him as a kick returner to start, yeah. and then if he gets more, and than that's that, if the that's if the injury doesn't, because we still don't know right. what the injury was. He was carted off on day three. What depending on what that injury is also going to affect his stock? Like, of course. is it significant enough where he can even test at the combine? We don't know. And the class is so deep, you miss yeah. a little bit and you plummet, right? So, yep. uh, but he was not the only faller. You got a question about another faller there, Fitzy. Yeah, Debro, uh, there was a wide receiver from North Carolina I fell pretty hard for in the fall when I was watching him make some big plays for Drake May. Um, Devontez Walker, known by many as just Tez Walker. Um, not a great week for him, correct? I mean, what's your mm-hmm. what's your takeaway? Was it just um, kind of a write-off? Can he be a big play guy at the NFL level? Because he's, he's big, he's fast. Um, he certainly looks the part of an NFL wide receiver, but what are your issues with him? So it was a tough week for Tez Walker. Um, as well as you, you want to talk about the ability, like to be there in mobile and to, and to peel your eyes, like on these guys physically and the things that you walk away just by seeing them in person. And Tez Walker is very skinny and I'm not telling you like he's a scarecrow or anything like that, but he's very slender. He's not as built as I thought he was going to be. Not to say he's not muscular in his own right, but but he wasn't as thick as I was hoping to be. And what I project him right now going into the NFL, like I think Tez Walker is a situational deep threat. I think that's all he is. And he had a tough week down at Mobile, whether it was gaining separation on short area routes, whether it was dealing with with drops or concentration drops or, or even fit physical um, attributes from the corners at the catch point, you saw all of these things rear their ugly head for Tez Walker. And you want to marry this also. His analytical profile is not clean, boys. Like in 2023, we're talking about a wide receiver that was 71st in yards per route run, 177th in PFF receiving grade, and, a, and 271st in yak per reception. So a lot of these warts already show up in his analytical profile, but you're also talking, you marry that with a tough week for Tez Walker he's really going to have to test well and interview well to really kind of save his NFL draft stock because at Mobile it was a tough scene yeah and I think there's a little bit of a built-in excuse for him in the fact that the NCAA just would not let him play for a big chunk of the year right but uh, you know the the drops are fixable that is a lot of concentration, but he also had them in the game. It wasn't just in practice. Yep. He had them in the game, too. And, um, you know, I didn't know the stuff about his body type and being a little bit slend- more slender than you would want for a guy at his size. So uh, glad glad we brought him up and brought that to light because there is a lot of talent here, um, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of questions, too. Are these drops part of nervousness? It, is he going to bulk up? And if he does, is that going to slow him down? So there's a lot of questions about Tez Walker. There's uh, a lot of talent D, there, though. D, bro, let me ask you, what do you think Tez is going to run at the combine? He's like 6'2". You think he can do something close to 4'4"? If he trains, the problem is I don't think he has a lot of weight to be able to cut to try to like, if he's not already a 4'4 guy, can he, if he's like, because some of these guys, can you say, okay, can they cut 5, 10 pounds and get from, you know, shave off just a little bit to get from 4'5 to 4'4, 4'4 to 4'3. I think Tez is probably going to come in somewhere in the low 4'5 range. You know, what's interesting, too, is I read uh, an article about the tracking info that they have at the Senior Bowl and the Shrine Game and stuff. Yep. And there are analytical teams that are scrapping 40-yard times, and they're just going yep. with the, those tracking speeds. The Rams yeah, all the zebra team. technology down there, man. Yeah, yep. the, the Rams mm-hmm. have been doing that, and that has got them Jordan Fuller in the sixth and Cooper Cup as a late pick because he ran about Puk- 40. Puka Dekua says hi. Puka Dekua <laughs> as well, a D-bro favorite down there. So, yeah, very interesting stuff there. Um I, I'm so you put this note on here for us, uh, D bro, that Luke McCaffrey will be a starting slot uh, wide receiver in the NFL. And I'm so glad that you put this here. And this is just another thing of being there is better because every note that I read about Luke McCaffrey was negative. Everything. It was that he can't separate. Then they're wrong. Uh, that he can't get off then a block. Uh, I'm telling you, this is these are the things that I read about Luke McCaffrey. I didn't see mm-hmm. one positive thing. So talk up your boy. Let's hear him. Man, that's all I gotta say is I'm gonna throw the the quote out from the great Ray GQ. Be mindful of the content that you consume because if anybody's telling you Luke McCaffrey had a terrible week, 
we were watching different practices, dude. Luke McCaffrey is exactly who he is. And what he did is he showed the proof of concept with his game as it currently is. And that is as a starting NFL slot wide receiver. If you ask Luke McCaffrey to play the outside and to stretch the field, you are poorly miscasting where he is as a skill player, as a wide receiver right now at this iteration of his game. Now, if you ask Luke McCaffrey to be in the slot, you ask him to go win in the short and intermediate areas, you ask him to play physical through the through the catch, and I'm not telling you he's going to walk into the NFL and be a yak maven. No, that's not, the, that's not the case. But can Luke McCaffrey, you put him in the slot in the NFL, can he get open versus zone coverage? And for everybody out there, as much as everybody wants to sit on their man coverage pedestals and crap like that mm -hmm. you need to understand that the the nfl is a massive zone coverage hub right now every single freaking team runs zone on over 50 percent of the defensive snaps at least and that's a low point almost every team is really in the 60 to 70 percent range is how much zone they're using in the nfl so if we want to bump guys down for man coverage or the ability to beat that or play outside and all this other kind of crap. We need context about skill sets and how guys win and what they're actually going to be asked in the NFL. And nine times out of 10 right now, that is beating zone coverage. And Luke McCaffrey can do that. So I want to give the guy his flowers as a guy who transitioned from quarterback to wide receiver in college, had two solid years at Rice. I'm not telling you that his analytical profile is amazing or standout, but we also do need to give this man some respect. For 2023, he was 26th in PFF receiving grade, and you see him religiously in Mobile get open on those crossers, on curl routes, on things where he is asked to beat coverage versus zone off coverage underneath. You ask McCaffrey to do that, and he sure as hell can do that. Now, what type of level of slot wide receiver are we talking about with him? Because uh, are we talking like, do you think he's like Josh Downs? Is he more like a Trey Tucker? I mean, what kind of slot uh, is Luke McCaffrey, do you think? I so my comp and I'm not going to just go with the low hanging fruit of okay former quarterbacks but I think and I'm not talking about the iteration that we have right now in the year 2023 2024 and what we've just seen out of his game this is going to be a big name but the way that Jacoby Myers entered the NFL and that type of skill set and what you ask him to do at the very beginning of his career and yes Jacoby Myers got better as far as playing the outside and versus press and versus man as he was an NFL wide receiver, yes. But when Jacoby Myers entered the NFL, you didn't see all of those parts or pieces as well refined to his game as it is now. That is my comp for Luke McCaffrey. Excellent. What do you got next for us, Fitzy? Let me ask you, Debro, about a guy, a wide receiver prospect, I think might be pretty polarizing among mm -hmm. dynasty managers, um, Xavier Leggett. Uh, so he is like this king-sized Anquan Bolden type, 6'3", 227 dude, um, really big 2023 season at South Carolina, but kind of a one-year wonder. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, he's he's kind of an older prospect, too. I think some people would say like an overaged prospect. Yep. 23. So, um, yeah, because that was like his his fifth year right yep. in the, the program. So um, like w what was your take on him? What did you see from Xavier Leggett in Mobile? So I, I'm going to I'll start off with this as far as context for Xavier Leggett's like week. If you look at his week, I think it was very up and down. But I think part of this is. He wasn't fully healthy at any point in Mobile. And some of this is projecting. I don't have any kind of sources or news that I'm trying to give to people. I'm just telling you I was there in Mobile and what I saw at him. And here's the context on it. One, he did leave day three of practice with an injury. He started out the morning, left, came back, just watched practice from the sidelines. But the first thing that I noticed out of, out of Leggett when we were down in Mobile was day one, we had wide receivers doing the gauntlet drill. We had them doing agility drills. Each one of these guys was going 110% through all of this, you know, trying to show out to coaches, like, look at my burst, look at my footwork, look at my speed, baby. Leggett's going through that drill at 50%. And mm. it wasn't like, oh, he's big and he's slow. It was, he's Sounds moving like maybe ginger. He was banged up coming in. Yes. 
he was not 100% healthy coming in is my my thought with it. As well as if you look at the entire week, he wore a compression sleeve over his uh, left lower leg. So I don't know if it was a calf. I saw some of the rumblings came out that the injury was an ankle. Come on, man. We, we don't freaking know. The only people that really know what the injury was was Leggett himself and the coaches and, and the staff of on, on for the senior bowl squads that were there. The rest of us are just out here just trying to figure out what, what the hell happened. But with Leggett, his game, it was a Jekyll and Hyde kind of week for him. And I think part of that, I think the injury played into that because in, we, in day one of practice, he looked like the tin man out there. Like he looked slow. He looked clunky getting in and out of his breaks. He didn't look like the guy, even the guy. And, I, and I'll, I'll own this. I'm not as high on Leggett as other people as far as him as a prospect. But I will give him respect in saying that there are parts of pieces to like out of his game. He is a guy that can produce after the catch. And for day one, we didn't see any of that. He was struggling just to separate versus corners. Now, in building all of this up, day two, he looked like a totally different guy. He was winning in one-on-ones. You saw better, uh, whether it was better gear down on short area routes or better separation, better uh, as far as upper body strength through his routes. I mean, just the totality of his game, he looked like a different person. And some of that is, okay, did you know, was it a calf? Was it another soft tissue injury? And did that affect him on day one where he's like, I can't push it the way that I usually do, but he's still going to go out there and try to help his stock any way that he can. Because here's the thing, NFL teams on the back end, if he was struggling with an injury, they know that. They're not going to bury the kid because he went out there and tried to gut through it and then ended up getting hurt that week in practice. So Leggett is a guy that he's got skills. I think he's an intriguing prospect, but... Some of the up and down to his game that I saw on film, as well as marrying that with other parts of his analytical profile, like you brought up, Fitzy, he's a guy that is not going to have an early breakout age. His dominant rating, we'll see what it comes in at, and things like that, where he's an older prospect, so already if he does hit... He's going to be a little bit more of an outlier. I'm more lower on Leggett, and this isn't so much from his his week at Mobile, just from what I saw on the film and my evaluation before I got to Mobile, and he didn't do a ton to really move me off of that. Uh, my, the last question that I have here, and then you know I'll, I'll throw it out to Fitz if he's got any other uh, players he wants to ask you about. I, I may have a couple in bonus time here, but Ricky Parasol, I mean... What mm -hmm. uh, what an outstanding college career this guy had at Arizona State. He he was, you know, Jane Daniels, number one target. It goes to Florida, suffers through some bad QB play, but it really made for a great highlight reel for him. Some of those catches that were out of his zone, showing his catch radius and how high he can go up. I mean, he had the maybe the highlight of the year with that one hander and triple coverage that he comes down mm -hmm. with. I mean, just an outstanding prospect from Florida. Probably going to be a top of the second round type of wide receiver after his performance here at the Senior Bowl, right? I think you, you can make a case for Pearsall anywhere from second or third round of the NFL draft. I have more of a round three grade on him. Um, but I, if if any one of these guys and in, and toss them all in a bucket of these round three guys that I'm talking about, sure. if you were to tell me that one team loves one of these guys and they're this year's Jaden Reed as a guy that goes in the second round and maybe none of us were forecasting you know, going in the second round, could that happen? I wouldn't be surprised, man, because teams are going to sit here and take shots on wide receivers they like, whether it's skill set, whether it's scheme fit, whether it's the entire total package. And Pearsall had a fantastic week, man. I mean, like, you cannot take take anything away from that man like whether it was route running whether it was you talked about Boggs like his abilities at the catch point I mean his his film his highlight film if you just turned on the, just the highlights for Pearsall it's ludicrous type of stuff like where you're if, just if like you just oh. watch a highlight video he's a first round pick for yes sure. yes but then we also need to marry that with the evaluation of Pearsall in a in a player that one uh, our own Thor Nystrom got a chance to talk to him and interview him. Uh, if y'all haven't watched the Senior Bowl recap video live on YouTube, please go check that out. We have all the player interviews in there. He talked about his highlight reel catches. He talked about it also that NFL teams are looking at him as a slot option. And I'm not saying that in any way to, to discredit Pearsall, but I think he's going to be a very serviceable and solid wide receiver in the NFL. I just question what his ceiling is based off of what I think are... 
good but not special raw athletic traits because again we also need to go back to and and I think it's very important with this week of practice and all the hype that we see these guys get in Mobile that you also have to go back to the eval. You can't just get out over your skis and say, oh, well, everybody at Senior Bowl is going in the top two rounds of the NFL <laughs> draft now. And I've seen that in some mocks. I have. I've seen that in some mocks. Because their names like, are the most popular right now. Exactly. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, Let's be real about this. Because still, Ricky Pearsall, as good of a week as he had in Mobile, and he did have a really damn good week. I, I, I'm not taking that away from him. You look at his profile, though. Last year at Florida, 86th in yards per route run, 53rd in PFF receiving grade, 131st in yak per reception. Those things also need to get brought up if you look at his profile and you're trying to marry the profile versus Mobile versus the film and saying, what is his median range of outcomes in the NFL? What is his ceiling range of outcomes in the NFL? I think that he's going to settle in as a wide receiver three or four on an NFL depth chart. I think he's going to be an extremely solid, solid guy for an NFL quarterback. He's going to be very quarterback friendly, big catch radius. But as far as big plays, the ability to win downfield, the ability to produce a ton of yak, those are the parts of his game where I think are going to limit him a little bit as far as the ceiling in the NFL. All right, Fitzy, any other prospects from the Senior Bowl that you want to lob a freewheeling question at, at Debro about? Yeah, just two guys, Debron. These can okay. be short answers if you wish. So I, I really fell hard for Ray Davis at Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, just like a really resourceful running back, a guy who can juke someone if he needs to or run over a defender if he needs to, can catch passes. I want to get your take on him. And I'm curious where you think Spencer Rattler might go in the draft. So first on Ray Davis, you want to talk about a prospect that helped himself a ton in Mobile? We have to we we have to mention Ray Davis. He had a beautiful one-handed catch. I think it was day two of practice where again everybody in the stands was like, all right, beautiful. Ooh, well done. I, I sir. think well everyone in the, everyone in the stands posted it on Twitter because I think <laughs> I saw about twelve different accounts post that video. I mean, give that man kudos, dude. Like he had a really good week in Mobile. And for an older prospect, a guy that's really kicked it around. I didn't get a chance to 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 talk to Ray Davis, and I wanted to. He was one of the guys that were on my short list of I wanted to ask him certain pointed questions in Mobile specifically about. And I went back and, and walking into Mobile, I watched Ray Davis games in 2019, 2020 film. And then when you turn on the 2023 tape versus Kentucky, what I really wanted to talk to Ray Davis about was he looked like a guy – and I'm not I'm not saying that he was not a gym rat to begin his collegiate career, but if you turn on the tape of Ray Davis 2019 and then you turn on a game from 2023, it looks like you're watching a different running back. The type of second level burst, the type of shiftiness he has in the open field in 2023 really opened my eyes as far as his overall evaluation. And it, it, I mean, the proof is in the pudding as far as his his numbers last year, 27th in yards after contact per attempt, 34th in breakaway run rate. And I think you add all of that on top of what he did in Mobile. I won't be surprised if Ray Davis hears his name called in the round in round four of the NFL draft. Probably more of a round five guy, but if, if a team loves him, I won't be shocked if he goes in round four. What about Rattler? Rattler, I think, is going to settle in to round three of the NFL draft. Maybe a team just gives, is over the moon and he goes round two. But I think the the median and the realistic projection for Rattler is entering Mobile. He was probably a guy that was like round four. He probably he probably goes in round three now, and a team takes a chance on him. And a lot of the things about Rattler's game, we've all watched the tape. We all know the career trajectory. We all know, you know, the clips that weren't great about him as a high school kid and being cocky. Rattler looks like a guy who has really taken it, taken in what life has given him and reached another level as far as being a professional. And we're, we're talking about a mature approach to everything. He was amazing in interviews and the time he gave to media throughout the entire week and changing that type of narrative about him going all the way back to high school. Because let's be real. 
It's like a 17, 18 year old yeah, who kid, look man. Like a spoiled little high school kid. Exactly. When, when you're 17, exactly. 18, every, all of you, us would have looked like somebody. Would, if you'd entered me, interviewed me when I was 17 or 18, I probably would have said some stupid stuff too, or, or would have sit here and probably carried myself or people would have said I'm immature. He's a teenager. Right. Don't bury this guy for things he did as a teenager. Yeah. So if we're talking about Rattler now as a prospect and as a person, he was amazing in interviews and he helped himself at Senior Bowl in the sense of you saw the arm talent and spurts he had a rough day one where he took some shots downfield threw a bad pick and then he went into check down mode but in saying that he bounced back in a really big way on day two and day three put some good throws on tape really interviewed well teams are also going to go back to the footage of early career and early collegiate career rattler and say Okay, what? Who is he now, and what could he be? So I think he's going to be if a team is looking for the lottery ticket kind of guy in the round three and saying, if we put skilled players around you, we have a good offensive line. We put you in a good system where you can we can reel in some of this YOLO mentality, some of this aggression that's misplaced for you at times, like um, like from a play to play perspective. If we can reel that in and try to get the very best out of you, that's where a team can say, okay, Spencer, you come in as a developmental guy or maybe you're a QB2 from the hop. What could you be? Could you be a starting NFL quarterback? Maybe. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to oh, I'd love to see him go to somewhere like Seattle or Tampa, where they've yeah. got a good bridge quarterback in place yep. and they don't need him to start or play at all in twenty twenty four, but maybe there's a path for him to become a starter two or three years down the road. Uh, yeah, I think I, Denver, I'd love that call. D- Denver, I think, is a good spot for him too. Maybe not in terms of development because he might be thrust into a role pretty quickly, as uh, Fitz mentioned. But uh, you I think know. if you put put him with the Rams, if you put him with the Rams Ooh, and let him sit behind Matthew it, yes. Stafford for two years, Great like call. basically, you take the Stetson Bennett corollary and you say, "But now we're going to get a better version of this." Yeah. The opposite of Stetson Bennett, too, like showed up to Senior Bowl, played great, won the MVP, all that stuff. All he really had to do was get out of Oklahoma. No no guys. off the field kind of mess. Yeah. yeah. All he had to do mm-hmm. was get out of Oklahoma. Yep. I, I have just just a couple more uh, to ask you about. And just two quick ones here. Malachi Corley, Brendan Rice, two guys coming in that I really, really like. And Brendan Rice is not his dad, but he is no. super underrated. He's very physical, kind of gives me Anquan Bolden vibes uh okay. and then um your thoughts on malachi corley as well i think rice is going to settle in as a dependable perimeter wide receiver four in the nfl maybe wide receiver three in an nfl offense like i don't think the ceiling is, is particularly high for brendan rice like he's a solid player all around and but the things about his game is that size works well depending on who he's matched up with if you put him at the corner that can be physical and can run with him then he could have problems both in his routes and at the catch point. Now, where he won in Mobile was with that upper body strength and his play strength overall. You saw him throw guys off of him or whether it was that late separation, that late little nudge that we all know that wide receivers can get away with in the NFL – that is how he wins Very at the nuanced. catch point and, and in his routes. And, you know, to his credit, but does that always translate to a high end wide receiver or does that type of game always translate to the NFL and that ability to win in that manner? That's my question about Brendan Rice. So I think he'll be a good pro. I don't think he's going to be otherworldly. And as far as Malachi Corley, like, I think he is who he is as far as being a manufactured touch guy. He's going to play the slot in the NFL. Western Kentucky just tried to get the ball in his hands. I, the way that I look at Malachi Corley is I look at him as a poor man's Rondell Moore. I don't think that he's fully as explosive or as athletic as Rondell Moore. I think he was used in – you you could say that was – that that's a harsh comp for him. And I understand that, but well, not he was coming used. out of college, but going into the NFL because Rondell Moore has been nothing in the NFL. No, yeah. Rondell Moore hasn't done anything, but you look at that type of player and people want to also throw, which I've heard Debo Samuel and Malachi Corley's name used in the same sentence. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that is dismissive to Debo Samuel, who he is as a wide receiver, who he is as a route runner and his ability to both play the slot and perimeter in his overall game. Malachi Corley is not Debo Samuel. I'm sorry, people. 
But mm -hmm. can he be good in the NFL for whatever he's asked to do as far as being that type of manufactured touch guy, being the guy that can play the slot, can give you some yak and stuff? The question that I have about Corley is – what is his ceiling at the NFL? And, and some of this comes down to the level of play at Western Kentucky and you breaking tackles against a guy at that level of competition versus you having the, the suddenness in your routes and the physicalness after the catch to break tackles versus NFL caliber, power five caliber type of guys. That's my worry about Malachi Corley and, and, and considering especially with the role that he's going to be asked to play. In, right. in fairness, he did have a good game against Ohio State last fall, That's Debro, fair. But That's uh, fair. I, I, I think he could maybe be like a sneaky kind of Rishi Rice type, but we've got all spring to argue about this. So, okay. Uh, That's I right. mean, my call for him was Parker Washington, so I'm kind of shading okay. in the middle a little bit. Yeah, look, Parker Washington, sure. just a guy that didn't get a lot of opportunity in Jacksonville, but when he did, he took advantage of it. So uh, we will see. But, Debro, thank you for the time uh, and all the great answers. Of course, remember to follow him at Debro underscore FF, at Fitz underscore FF for Fitzy and at Bogman Sports for myself. We will see you guys next week. Take it easy, everybody.